It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 278 at block height 698,307 on Monday, August 30th. What is up today, guys? We missed a week. Ah, we did miss a week. It's been busy, you know. Um, what's up is it is a warm day in Colorado, and just working with my wife, uh, she's now like seven months pregnant so you know we might be missing a day here and there because there's like steps and procedures before you have a birth and a lot of what have yous how dare you ditch this podcast to take care of your wife and and child how fucking dare you i know (laughs) so that's what's been up here but uh how you guys doing on uh blood janine i think that's the best excuse ever I like those occasional what have yous. Yeah. It's occasional what have yous until all of a sudden what have you is a baby. Time to be an adult. Yeah. But I'm going to stick around with the podcast. I mean, you know, I just love Bitcoin. I love you guys. I love talking about this stuff. There's, uh, you know, I'll always be able to squeeze in the podcast. Just might have to skip a week or something here and there. We'll see how it goes. Your weekly hour and a half to two hours of not being an adult begins. Right. This is the playtime. So we're going to get crying babies in the background. Like, you know, Janine has cats, right? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, similar. We'll have a baby maybe every now and again alongside us. I think mine cries more. (laughs) Well, we'll have to see that. Clearly, you should have seen her two days ago. She would not shut up. Oh, goodness, the kitties. All right. So, I guess before we jump into the actual stuff on the news desk, um, you guys see the uh, the vaccine passport blockchain project being funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation? So- yeah. Hmm. And the wait. government of Estonia. Wait, wait, wait. I looked at that document. I actually looked through it. And I don't know about you guys, but I did not actually see anything that was explicitly about blockchains or blockchain-like things. What I saw was it talked about using um, public key cryptography, which to lay people, they may get easily confused. And I think that's how some people, somebody suggested that it was about blockchains because that's the only place they've encountered that. But I did not see anything about blockchains. I saw public key cryptography. Well, then, the cryptographic vaccine passports that are totally some deranged Alex Jones conspiracy theory that could never happen in the real world. I mean, chipping people to track their movements. What a delusional concept, right, guys? (laughs) Yeah, the times we live in, for sure. I mean, uh, yeah, I didn't see anything about blockchain, but for sure, digital certificates and tracking and contact tracers and, you know, quarantine camps. It's it's real. I mean, I've seen it. And, you know, it's not like the I've oh, I've heard it through Alex Jones. It's like I've seen these like reports from Queensland, Australia, how they're building this wellness center. And if you got COVID, you're going to this camp. And it's really quite crazy how the whole conspiracy theory world became a reality. I have pasted link to said document in the, in the chat if anybody wants to actually read it. I'm so angry. I've had enough of these people. Well, we can say, yeah, it is starting to show, like, big uprisings against this in, you know, like, France and Australia 
And, uh, well, those areas, I mean, we need to see more of that kind of stuff like the truckers in Australia. We need to see similar movements like that in New Zealand and Canada because, you know, like we were talking about in the pod, like at the beginning, uh, before this was, we were talking about how it just seems like those areas have sort of already bent the will to the surveillance state without ever, you know, dropping a soldier in there. Yeah, well, that's understandable for Australia because Australia started off as a prison, and so everyone who lives there has this this kind of accept prison mentality, I think. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> They're just it's going back like, to the... It's like we're, we're living on a prison planet. Sorry, the oh, puns are just too easy. You hit all the trigger notes, I know it. We're going to get deleted off of YouTube. I hope so. We need to relaunch on Rumble and BitChute and uh, create our own platform or something. I, I watched an interesting Kurtzgesagt video today about how to terraform Venus. Um, it will take thousands of years, apparently, but it was interesting. <laughs> Lots speaking of climate. Of, uh, speaking of escaping the prison. All the terraforming projects are going to take 10,000 years. It's a Halliburton conspiracy. <laughs> Climates, they change. The, the proposal involved um, installing giant mirrors between Venus and the sun. Oh my so, god. So that, so that Venus freezes over, and then we shoot the ice off into space... And then we use the carbon dioxide to make oceans. And then we put different mirrors around Venus so that when we remove the first mirror, the planet doesn't burn up and it gets an Earth-like climate. I believe that was the train of steps. Um, even I'd giving like the benefit of the doubt here, I'm going to have an autism moment here. That would still require finding like the perfect spot between Venus and the sun. And you'd have to take into account orbital velocity differences. So you'd have to pick a Lagrangian point, which is not going to let you hit the maximum optimum to fully cover the sun or enough of the sun to do that in between Venus and, and the sun. And the engineering for that would be insane. You're talking like the most massive structure ever constructed by human beings. And even if you did something like constructed out of mylar, like what they build solar sails out of, you're still going to need to build a structurally sound framework to hold that. And, you know, tiny little bits of dust are just going to start blowing holes through the mylar. Yeah, well, you... they're, they didn't mention any of that. They just said it'll take thousands of years, a.k.a. we'll be smarter and p more powerful in the future, so it'll be easy. Yeah, plus we'll have robots to do it for us. Right. They don't have time clocks to punch into. Also, we will be able to engineer our own uh, ecosystem to put on the planet, too. Like, as in biological life. Why do we even want to go to Venus? Aren't we talking about, like, the sun's going to turn into a red giant and consume Earth eventually? Like, Venus is before the Earth. Yeah, I, 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 don't, uh, I, don't, I don't know. That was, it was just a weird video. Very cute animation. <laughs> well. There, there was a very disturbing moment where um, a bird character in a spacesuit, uh, its head just exploded into blood because it landed on Mars. And there was too, or Venus, no, it landed on Venus and there was too much uh, uh, pressure. <laughs> so wow. that was nice. Anyway, showtime. Yeah, the space race will continue now for the space race of mining in Bitcoin land. Yeah, so this is actually something i've kind of been expecting for quite a while now um since blockstream launched their initial blockstream mining hosting setups um two big things uh one from last week and one from this week last week blockstream announced their new um, blockstream energy service which is effectively um, containerizing mining operations 
um, sort of like how GAM um, upstream uh, data do like little mobile modular uh, mining units to be able to deploy anywhere that there is, you know, stranded energy, um, energy production where the grid isn't consuming anything and actually use the Blockstream satellite feed uh, to connect those to the network so that Pretty much Blockstream now under this division is going to be going around buying up stranded or excess energy everywhere, um, <clears throat> the same way that Great American Mining and other companies are, which in and of itself is a fucking huge thing. But then this week, um, they announced a $210 million Series B funding, um, as well as the acquisition of, I believe, the Israeli company, um, Spoondulies, which is a pretty old ASIC manufacturer, as well as all of their intellectual property. And they're going to be folding um, Spoondulies' entire team into um, Blockstream with the end goal of producing their own mining equipment and as well, um, Adam Back um, went into in an interview, um, not depending on China so much for fab capacity, which kind of ties into another interesting piece of news. Um, TSMC, um, Taiwan um, Semiconductor uh, Corporation, is apparently now finally starting to figure out the logistics um, of shipping a bunch of equipment from Taiwan to Arizona here in the United States, um, where they, under the Trump administration, set up an agreement to open a fab plant on U.S. soil. So, like, this is this is kind of the vertical integration really starting to come home in this space in the sense of Blockstream started off as effectively a financial services company. Like their main product, Liquid, was like the whole business model of the company. Build the platform to allow financial services to be built out <clears throat> in a way that can interact with Bitcoin and these types of blockchain based systems and kind of be a Red Hat style company where they are effectively the software platform maintainer provider. And all they're really doing here is their technical expertise is for sale to help build things on it. And they have gone from that in the beginning to now being a soon to be vertically integrated mining company with co-hosting facilities, energy uh, capacity available, these mobile mining units that are going to seek out energy sources they don't already have at their disposal and eventually fabbing their own fucking asics here outside of china so like this is a really kind of big massive shift for blockstream as a company in terms of the types of, of services and, and and markets they're getting involved in and really there, there's one question left in my mind about how far this goes um for, for the most part in north america there are not really any fab plants that have a low enough nanometer capacity to produce um competitive asics like the only game on this continent is pretty much intel but with tsmc moving over here um that eventually over the years you know, being a completed project offers the potential to kind of shift away from that Intel monopoly on North American soil. And I really kind of wonder, given that Blockstream is one of the original companies that had Bitcoin on their balance sheet for the obvious reasons to do that as a reserve asset in their treasury, um, in the next five to 10 years, could we actually see Blockstream well capitalized enough to sink money into their own fabrication plant in North America? Because that's really the last piece in terms of vertically integrating a mining stack here that they don't already have. So yeah, th this, this is going to be a huge fucking thing. But I still think there's that one 
last leap down the line that could be done. So those uh, Blockstream, are they mobile mining units? Those are kind of interesting. Uh, I listened to Adam and Samson describe them on uh, Preston Fish's podcast. And they're basically like the inverse of a Tesla charger. So you rent this box or you lease this box from them or you could buy it. And it basically just sits there. And what the box will do if you would like is you can sell it power and it'll just sit there and it'll buy all the power from you at at the given rate that it can handle and that's that's that yeah so, so like you this sorry you're you're just clearing power as a power provider which is kind of interesting right you are completely abstracted from the bitcoin nature of that box you just have a place that you can sell power to mm -hmm. And like that has just massive implications, like t two aspects of that. One is that is a huge game changer for renewable energies in terms of like, fuck the, the carbon equations, the, the hidden cost on the back end, but just making it more profitable quickly in trying to build out those types of energy sources. So Blockstream getting into that is pretty huge because, you know, to my understanding, uh, Great American Mining, Upstream, like all these companies kind of doing this mobile um, unit deployment, one is mostly looking at wasted energy like gas flaring um, for natural gas wells. And two, they're, they're sourcing equipment from other manufacturers like they're they nowhere near as close to the actual ASIC production part of the supply chain as Blockstream is now or was just because of the the scale that they're at before um, acquiring spoon dubies but you know that that's kind of my second point here is the scale at which that type of wasted energy could be utilized now I think like th this completely changes now that you're talking about Blockstream having acquired an actual ASIC manufacturer versus these companies that are kind of, <clears throat> you know, they're almost entirely based around just acquiring hardware from other places and then setting up the units. You know what I mean? So like the potential scale of this um, that could wind up deployed in the real world, I think has a much higher potential ceiling and growth rate um, now that Blockstream is getting involved in this. Yeah, this puts them into a category of something like industrial power equipment provider. Mm -hmm. Blockstream doing the industrial size Bitcoin moving. Uh, it's pretty awesome. I mean, yeah, like you were saying, just to be really starting from like uh, just sort of financial consulting on this asset class with Bitcoin and um, moving into liquid and you know, getting this raised to where it's like over a $3 billion company now, you know, that's really pioneered like a lot of stuff that has the foresight that others just don't have as far as like doing the the satellite mining and uh, trying to work with federated side chains and uh, develop solutions that are competitive to other uh, second layer solutions and just trying to advance the whole network forward. So it's good to see them move with such a large stack and try and just move the industry forward and in North America and the United States. Like, I mean, like you're saying that chip fab is supposedly coming to Arizona. And I mean, a lot of this mining is going to different parts of North America. So, I mean, this is all good. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be good forever for the, uh, the, the Blockstream overlord memes too. Mm -hmm, but, and you, the, the last thing, like, that really I like about this is, you know, frankly, liquid adoption has been ridiculously slow because one, at least this is my take on it. Most of the big exchanges in this ecosystem don't want to integrate something like liquid because that type of not liquidity constrained second layer, it makes it way too easy for liquidity to just flow out to other businesses and that's what they make their money off of so it's kind of an incentive misalignment that is really slowing shit down where it's all these small players 
that are plugging into that system because they actually have more to gain than lose in that regard. In that, you know, ideally at that scale, they attract more liquidity than they bleed because they're all smaller entities. So like, and also just like the, the non Bitcoin arbitrage use, like other types of financial assets and, and things like Bitcoin is just not big enough or integrated enough into the legacy system to really see a motivation to start building more conventional financial products on something like liquid to be able to interoperate with Bitcoin easier. So having gone so far down the rabbit hole of mining as another service or operation as a company, that gives them more revenue, more viability to continue to exist as a company and continue building things like liquid and the types of stuff you can put on top of it out without being so concerned about like, where's the money coming from? Like they can kind of, you know, ease back and take their time in doing that side of their business because mining is something that will actually be profitable and generate income. They, if they play this right, could become a really large player in this space uh, if for no other reason than nobody seems to be as far along as they are right now. Uh, the other thing that was interesting that we have talked about in the past year uh, that was talked about on that podcast were the Bitcoin mining notes, uh, which sound like they've been going along earning very well uh, and have been noticed to the point that they would like to be able to provide something to U.S. customers. So we'll see if U.S. customers ever get to invest in things like that. Uh, should we, it just seems like they could attract a pretty good sized capital pool that could help to build out various aspects of these plans. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure they're going to pull it together and Blockstream is just going to, you know, keep moving forward. It's going to, I mean, it's one of the companies that's just like the all-star crew of pumps and really has a good head on their shoulders as far as seeing like uh, Bitcoin in the future and where it needs to go and how exactly it should get there. So kudos to those guys. I'm sure they're going to do great. Now for some other guys that are trying their hand at all this and then it shut down, what's going on with uh, compass mining? So the compass mining guys uh, primarily do things like hosted mining uh, for people, I believe. So you can supply them with machines or you can, I believe, rent, definitely buy machines from them. And then they'll take care of them in a data center for you and you get to pay power bills and uh, that sort of thing and end up with some Bitcoin at the end. Uh, and uh, it sounds like Compass Mining recently ran into a little bit of the trouble that we've seen with the banking industry lately and got deplatformed. Uh -oh. So, yeah, these, these poor guys, Chase Bank, of all companies, shut down the company's bank account. Uh, so the CEO, of course, took to Twitter to call him out, uh, said that he was moving to uh, SVB, Silicon Valley Bank, which has evidently helped a lot of people in this sort of uh, position in the past. And uh, let's see, one other thing of note, Compass Mining evidently has a hash rate close to 500 petahash. So uh, they, they host a fair amount of hash, uh, but you know, Chase can't be bothered with this, um, I really like the quote from the article on this. Uh, their CEO, Whit Gibbs, said, fortunately, the company doesn't entrust its finances solely in one dusty ass institution. So business operations will move on as usual. <laughs> so um, good, hmm. good call on not sticking with just one dusty ass financial institution. I imagine they've got some stables and some other things going on over there. But what if the other dusty ass financial institutions decide to do similar things? We're going to have to all go Substack, man. Start taking those lightning payments. Yep. Like, seriously, though, this is like. I mean, inevitably, if, if this just keeps spiraling, like, they go to the point where they're going to have to just start taking Bitcoin only. I mean,. I'm not aware of a single stable coin out there that does not have like freeze and seize functionality 
in the protocol. I think going forward, a lot of these businesses, um, if you just deal with fiat, you're kind of in minimal viable product mode. Like you, you have to build out those other channels alongside. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, th these are kind of the trade-offs though, of actually having a legal claim to anything when you're talking about cloud mining. Um, you know what I mean? Well, this is, this is kind of like infra rails type stuff, right? This is deplatforming a business because for whatever reason, you don't think it should be around. And, you know, it's not quite as bad as UK taking it out of the hands of customers. It's, it's more fucking with these guys because you can. And I don't, I can't say I know the exact motivations of the banks, but this is the sort of industry when Blockstream comes up and all the dreams are realized and they're selling that sort of stuff, the banks are going to want to be in this industry. So you're almost deplatforming a competitor, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of that going around. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, I guess Compass Mining is going to get this thing back in order and try and get things going again, but it definitely sort of shows that you got to have this uh, full stack whenever you're getting into this industry of getting ready for the banks to come at you. Yeah. All right. So just north in the YO, what are they doing up there? Yeah, the great YO. So yeah, Wyoming has been seeing a huge uptick in their crypto ecosystem across the board with legislation passed to try and attract those companies and networks working to be regulatory compliant. So now there's been an effort to establish an RFP or request for proposal for blockchain interruptible service agreements or BCIS, which like they're just boilerplate electricity contracts used for quote crypto miners. And the service agreement under the BCIS tariff must include 10,000 kilowatts, uh, kilowatts of use or greater, a uh, term of at least two years. It's got to have specific pricing in this two-year contra contract with price renegotiation every three years and negotiated service interruption negotiated service interruption provisions which is the size of interruptible load a notice of planned interruption duration of interruption and maximum hours of interruption per year and then there's other requirements as defined by the bcis tariff and in the service agreement there's an attachment of good standing financials project specifics and an nda if you uh, cruise through the application, you can see they get down to specifics like your operations, longitude and latitude, any current mining operations that you're working out of Wyoming. Are the bidders willing to pay a premium for higher costs to avoid being curtailed in, off in peak hours? Is the bidder interested in only off-peak energy or tiered pricing for on-peak versus off-peak? And there's a lot more, to be honest. And... Mm -hmm. At any point, the electricity contract company has the right to interrupt the mining service to bring customers reliable energy. And I mean, this all looks pretty good try for uh, some people trying to cross all the T's and dot all the I's, but it might limit the mining industry in the state as well. I mean, we'll have to follow along and see how it develops. As it stands uh, in the document, you can see it's... Uh, it's I've got 120 megawatts up for potential BCIS agreements in Wyoming. So there's 120 megawatts up for mining. And uh, they're taking applications until September 7th. And then the BCIS agreements will be executed on October 15th. So we'll have to see how it goes. But, I mean, it does look like a lot of details that I'm sure uh, a lot of miners wouldn't really want to fill out. But I'm sure some... Might want to. So, uh, what did you guys think? Well, Blockstream's gonna invade Wyoming. <laughs> what a what a request for a proposal kind of is. I mean, they're standing up and they're saying we've got 120 megawatts of power, just kind of sitting around, evidently. And we would we would sure love 
to get somebody to buy it. And here's a whole lot of characteristics that would be great if somebody just wanted to come in and buy it. And it'll be fun because basically they're looking for a standard around contracts like this, right? And there are probably a lot of companies that have experience negotiating this in other places and uh, will come in and uh, make some offers. And there might be a little pony trading behind the scenes. It'll be interesting to see if any companies end up landing one of these. Yeah, I'm sure that will be the case. Like you're saying, I mean, uh, like we were saying, like Blockstream, you know, companies like that and other companies that just have like equipment ready to go that just need a place to put them down. I mean, I wouldn't see why they wouldn't put it a bid down. I mean, it, it looks like you can kind of set your price for the electricity contract. Uh, you know, it, if you get it, you'll see, you know, but um, I'm sure a lot of people are going to try and get some good cheap mining going there and uh we'll see how it goes but like we're saying i mean it's the deadline's coming soon and you know they're gonna they're gonna start running soon so we'll see how it goes yeah for scale reference um a number of the projects we talked about earlier this year when we heard of a number of the the various u.s companies starting to build out stuff and canadian build outs a lot of people were talking about a 30 megawatt kind of number as a scale for a build out so 120 would be a good four installs like that so maybe they'll get lucky and they'll get multiple companies uh bidding that it would be very nice if uh a couple companies got in there and then they could uh negotiate some contract standards and stuff well i mean i think like that's the most important aspect of this fud like you hit the nail on the head there because like th this is just the dynamic of any miner that's connected to the power grid there will be situations where they yank your power like in the middle of the fucking winter, you have electric heating everywhere. It's freezing. Um, your shit's getting shut down when everybody turns the fucking heat on. Like same thing in the summer with air conditioning. Like that it's happened multiple times in multiple states, multiple countries. Like when the demand is there um, for necessary things in terms of the wider consumer market, you as a miner, um, bye bye. Like you're, you can come back when everybody doesn't need to stop from freezing or fucking baking to death in the summer. And that will always be how it is. So like standardizing contractual terms of that, instead of just having different, you know, jurisdictions, um, governments or regulating bodies making arbitrary situations, that is a much more predictable environment for miners to consider like running and expanding operations in versus just like when when is this arbitrary you know rug pull going to happen absolutely i mean just the way that he set up the contracts to where it's like are you going to try and run you know are just during off peak or are you going to try and run on peak like i think that's an interesting way because this uh you know, Bitcoin power arbitrage, you know, play for, uh, you know, how exactly to best manage your grid and, um, you know, make income while also, you know, serving users and trying to just like make your grid as efficient as possible. I think that, uh, you know, like you're saying, there's some operations where you're just going to know like, OK, they don't even want to deal with uh, peak energy prices or a premium like we're just going to yank their power where other guys they might try to work through it and uh, you know see how exactly that whole power arbitrage evolves. Well, are we ready to move on to an idiot being an idiot? What? No, come on. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're just ready to talk about some dust limits going away, I guess, or potentially. Well, uh, Jeremy Rubin, um, the designer of OpCTV, Op, uh, Check Template Verified, uh, apparently, at the beginning of this month, um, started a discussion on the mailing list about removing the dust limit, which is a peer-to-peer -peer policy um, limit on whether or not you will broadcast or mine a transaction by default in Bitcoin Core, um, pretty much based on the economic viability of an output. So like if it costs more in fees than that output is worth to actually spend in the future, 
it's not relayed. Like people with default software will not mine it because what you're doing is you're adding something to the UTXO set, which is the entire scaling bottleneck of Bitcoin that there is no economic incentive to ever remove by spending it. So you're pretty much adding to the validation costs of every node operator forever because there is no economic incentive to ever spend this output. His rationale is it's not our business what outputs people want to create. Um, as a node operator that has to bear the cost of that, yes, it is. Um, his ar he argues that you can use dust outputs to create authentication protocols on chain. Use fucking op return. It allows you to encode any piece of arbitrary data without affecting the UTXO set. It's existed for forever. Um, he brings up the issue of dust-sized HTLCs on the Lightning Network. I'm sorry, too bad. Yes, if fees go up, it becomes uneconomical to route small values with HTLCs on the Lightning Network because you are losing more money than you than, than that is worth to try and enforce that on chain if you have to. That has been a harsh reality of the Lightning Network from day one. I'm sorry, figure that out on the Lightning Network. Not fucking with the validation costs and denial of service risks that this presents to by trying to fuck with things on the main chain. Um, bringing up colored coin protocols. Again, op return. And he's also trying to use confidential transactions, which is never going to make it into the main chain, but let's say it did. Um, you wouldn't be able to enforce a dust limit with confidential trans. Yes, you can. It's called a range proof. That's literally what confidential transactions is fucking built on. It is a proof that the values in an output meet certain conditions. So include one showing it's above the fucking dust limit. But yeah, um, this is the most idiotic, short-sighted, dumb shit ever. And it is, it, it, this is Ethereum thinking. Oh, um, a, a necessary restriction to protect the ability to validate the base layer of the system um, causes constraints for things built on top of that system. That's too bad. That's how it works. And the fact that a fucking core developer is trying to argue for this for these reasons is utterly fucking idiotic. And it, it, it is just fucking, it, yeah, it, it is thinking like a moron in the Ethereum space, completely ignoring the reality of trade-offs because I just don't want to have to consider things like engineering constraints when building on something. Too fucking bad. Fuck off then. Oh man. Yeah, that does sound like a, uh... Like a stupid thing to put forward then. Yeah, so th this is going to be fun to watch this fucking conversation evolve and him continue pushing for that. I wonder what other fucking idiotic shit he's going to start to fucking agitate and antagonize for. But let's see. Well, we'll certainly see how it evolves. Like, th this is quite literally trying to introduce an attack vector into Bitcoin. That that's what removing the dust limit would do. One day he'll have a fork of his own. Anyway, yeah, I have nothing left but angry insults if you want to take us into the next thing, Jimmy. Because the next thing sounds fun, yeah. Yeah, in the last episode of Block Digest, episode 277, I talked about the very funny story of the so-called poly network getting hacked for a polyton of crypto assets and then to their great luck getting it returned because the hacker thought they'd be a good person and it was honestly too easy to do anyway according to their FAQ that they sent a bunch of Ethereum transactions. Well, small update, um, Poly Network announced on August 17th that not only were they awarding him with a bounty but they would be hiring him as chief security advisor. Quote, we have maintained contact with Mr. White Hat, communicating the 
the progress on a daily basis. We have made constant efforts to establish an understanding with Mr. White Hat and generally hope that Mr. White Hat will transfer the private keys as soon as possible so that we can return full last control back to the users at the earliest. Mr. White Hat shared his concerns about Poly Network security and overall development strategy in a recent public dialogue. The Poly team is actively working with organizations that are equipped to provide security solutions with the aim of presenting the public with a robust and secure system that is fully prepared for Poly Network's recovery and revamp. Blah, 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 blah. Um... Yeah, we sincerely hope Mr. Whitehead can understand our appeal and continue to actively cooperate with us. We are also counting on more experts like Mr. Whitehead to be involved in the future development of Poly Network since we believe that we share the vision to build a secure and robust distributed system. Also, to extend our thanks and encourage Mr. Whitehead to continue conducting security uh, advancement in the blockchain world together with Poly Network, we cordially invite Mr. Whitehead to be the chief security advisor of Poly Network. Poly Network previously promised to reward Mr. White Hat with a $500,000 bug bounty, but he did not accept it and has publicly stated that he has considered offering it to the technical community who have made contributions to blockchain security. We fully respect Mr. White Hat's thoughts, and to express our gratitude, we will still transfer this $500,000 bounty to a walled address approved by Mr. White Hat for him to use at his own discretion for the cause of cybersecurity and supporting more projects and, and individuals. So what I find really funny about this is, so I was under the understanding that they'd fit, when I saw this announcement, I was like, oh, they finished with him sending all of the assets back. No, they are writing this post knowing that he still has access to the, he still has private keys for a bunch of the stuff that he stole. They say in the post that they're not going to hold him legally responsible. And that's interesting. But if I was Mr. White Hat, I'd be like, hmm, I wonder if they're just be cut out. saying money and they're also offering a job. It's like, this is kind of a lot. Is this not a trick? <laughs> False flag. Okay. Kudos to Mr. White Hat. And Mr. White Hat, I know you do not need any business or otherwise advice from me. You have proven that my advice would just pale in comparison to what's already going on. So I'm not offering this to you, but I'll just offer it to anybody else out there. I think Mr. White Hat is, is now in a very enviable position. He's he's now, you know, avoided the taxes on half a million dollars. However, it's sitting in an account that evidently, you know, he just might happen to know the private key to. So that's that's OK. Kudos, number one. Now, Mr. White Hat, going forward, and I know your services are going to be very valuable to the network here. I would I would recommend you uh, think about a fund unlock rate that is something like it's a, it's going to be a very simple function it's something like if consulting fees are less than amount unlocked consider unlock else you know ask for more consulting fees very very simple formula um i don't know if you want to share it with them explicitly or not but uh you can only win mr whitehead Seems like such a crazy inside job. Yep. And I like the way they just like dropped the you fucker. <laughs> like they like when they called him fucker last time. Now it's just like Mr. White Hat, Mr. White Hat. No no no. So um the thing that I read last time, I first read their actual letter, which was the English wasn't quite eh. But then I read a, another one that someone rewrote it and they said all of those expletives, which is funnier because it's like more honest about how they probably felt at the time. <laughs> yeah. But no, they've been using formal, not angry language. And I, but this in particular, I just, I'm actually looking right now to see if there's an, any update on whether he's finally finished giving back the money. Because if he hasn't, this is like super interesting. Yeah, I think that's the point they want us to get. They want us to say their network a bunch of times, and they want us to say, like, oh, they got this big hack, and then people are going to start knowing the name, and they're not going to understand. Like, it was, they figured it out because it was a hack 
and they're going to already have invested in it and be like, well, it's it's accountable now because they hired the hacker. It's just, it seems like, uh, you know, kind of reminds me of Zcash and Ecoin Company and all the Decentraland craziness. So I did just check their Twitter account on August 26th. They said that they completed the recovery of all the assets that were stolen. So that did finish. Um, it's also funny looking through their profile that they're having a ton of issues right now because I guess their system runs on Ethereum and so Ethereum had the chain split, and so it's like, ah, all oh, crazy. It's actually a bigger deal right now that Ethereum is having a chain split than the fact that they almost lost $610 million. <laughs> Jeez. Shit shows all the way down. Yep. Well, I guess things are starting to clean up in lightning land a little bit. Well, somewhat. Um... So, this is something that's finally actually worming its way into everything. Um, but there is a uh, scheme called Lightning Address, um, which is, I guess you could kind of say, like a namespace layer for Lightning. Um, and there, there are very important trade-offs to consider here. Um, so I think really in some situations, this is a massive utility and win, but in others, you can actually be creating risks that didn't previously exist. Um, so in the case of custodial services, I think this could be a huge win. Um, the, the general kind of scheme here is you, you have an actual like domain, like a traditional DNS domain, um, that's providing like a sub bucket of a namespace and a server that resolves individual um, usernames to actual lightning invoices. So like, let's say strike.me. Um, they can spin up a server implementing this. And then Rick at strike.me is all my lightning wallet needs whether it's a, another custodial lightning wallet, um, a non-custodial wallet that supports the scheme, is to know rick at strike.me. And my wallet can go to strike.me, ping the server they're running for this, and go, I want to pay rick. And then get that invoice, pay it out to strike, and this gets debited to your account, rick. So. Nice. In terms of just a nice user experience, um, reconciling custodial wallets, um, talking to each other, I think this could be a huge thing. Um, cause like th this would really simplify, you know, the traditional way that people are used to using things like Venmo, um, cash app, et cetera, would allow you to easily you know, pay or interact with somebody that's using a different service than you. Like it's just the exact same structure as an email address. You're already trusting this custodial service. So you're not really changing anything. Having this extra like DNS to say server existing that a wallet pings before it makes a payment. And it just streamlines the entire payment flow, user experience and ease of interoperating across like different um, custodial businesses that use Lightning like this. And it also is a huge potential to just simplify that interaction from non-custodial to custodial wallets. But when you start looking at the idea of using this for non-custodial wallets, I think it potentially starts becoming more of a negative than a positive. Um, in terms of like a non-custodial wallet um, using this to receive payments. Because you have to have a server online all the time under a domain that is constantly listening for people going, I want to pay whoever, like shinobi at shinobi.com. So I either have to run my own server like that, which is something to, you know, I have to keep on top of, I have to manage um make sure that this is running properly and securely because if that thing was ever compromised 
like any payment request made to it could just get routed somewhere else and I never get money that was supposed to come to me. Or the middle ground, um, you effectively, if you want to not have to run that yourself, um, you have to trust whoever you choose to run that for you if you're using that as a service. Because using this protocol, that this is a middleman thing in between your actual lightning node or wallet and where people are pinging to go, I want to pay you money. So it's like on, on the end of something for custodial service users to be using, I think this is a massive win, a fucking huge user experience improvement. Um, and it, that can also help non-custodial users trying to interact with such custodial users. But I think the more you creep towards trying to use this protocol with a non-custodial Lightning Wallet receiving things, I'm not so sure that the positives outweigh the, the potential negatives. Even if it's custodial only it seems like a giant ux win and understanding win for the broader potential market for this um so seems like a very worthwhile thing to pursue mm -hmm. yeah i mean ever since i saw the uh the strike dot me i thought that was really like a a big win for the lightning network and just trying to move forward towards you know similar networks that people understand, like you're saying, like Venmo and PayPal, where people understand an address like that, where they still don't quite understand like a lightning address is they get kind of long. Yeah, but it's just, it's the recognizing the trade-offs in the different situations, like rushing to use this as a non-custodial lightning user. I think people should consider that, but you know, like Fudd said, this, this is a huge win for any type of custodial thing because you like, which is naturally going to be something more non-technical users are onboarded to. And it, it just pushes the user experience down to the point of the normie shit that they're used to using. And it doesn't really change anything security wise because it's a custodial service anyway. Right on. So Janine, this, this is a, a cool lightning development. What's up next? Yeah, on August 23rd, the Open Node project announced that, quote, Substack, an online publishing platform with over 500,000 paying subscribers, has integrated their Bitcoin API to offer Bitcoin payments on the online publishing platform. Open Node will power both on chain and Lightning Network Bitcoin payments. Um, and then further, it says, working together, OpenNode and Substack are starting by making instant low-cost payments available to a select group of crypto-focused publications. Readers will be able to use Bitcoin to pay for subscriptions to these select publications, and the publications will retain earnings in Bitcoin. So, yeah, they're not offering it to everyone. Uh, there was a few people complaining that they couldn't use Bitcoin to subscribe to other people uh, who... It were not crypto focused publications, but um, it doesn't sound like they're going to keep it contained to this small group. They're just testing it out first with people who are already probably knowledgeable and interested in receiving Bitcoin, which makes sense because otherwise, if you want to pay other people who aren't interested in taking Bitcoin or don't know how to, uh, yet, then Substack will have to handle and hold any payments you send them and maybe they don't want to do that. They just want you to be able to pay the subscribers in Lightning and the people on the other end actually receive it. Yeah, I yeah. think that the technicals are really what matter here because anything custodial, like the Substack cannot just kind of fly under the radar like some things have. Like that, that would be something they would have to deal with. Yeah, so this uh, all makes sense to me, and it's also really good news. What's yeah. that? Censorship-resistant internet money is finally getting taken for journalism? Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh. I mean, this is definitely going to contribute to the outrage from mainstream journalists about the fact that Substack even exists and allows journalists to 
build their own media platform or use you i don't know distribute their free thought without restriction or editorial censorship i don't know oh they get mad well, it seems like a feather in bitcoin's legitimacy cap to me yeah i mean i mean like bitcoin with uh wikipedia was always kind of like one of the, I'm not Wikipedia. What am I talk about? WikiLeaks was always like uh, really powerful, and um, so to see it go across the board and next level with Lightning on Substack, that sounds pretty awesome. So it's really funny that you made that uh, slip up because there's tons of Wikipedia people to this day who are so angry about WikiLeaks using the wiki name and like besmirching <laughs> them with their with their award winning journalism. <laughs> They're lucky that WikiLeaks even tied their name to, to something similar. I mean, because you know, whatever they don't own Wiki, and uh, and yeah, WikiLeaks did it right. All right, so there's some more lightning stuff up on uh, Ellen Router. Look up. Yeah, so I didn't really have much of a chance to drop in uh, to the Telegram room that is set up for this to ask questions this week. I was kind of busy, but um, yeah, it's this new service to effectively look up information um about different routing nodes including inbound and outbound capacity to decide how to allocate your own liquidity in the lightning network to optimize your revenue and the thing there these are all just me making deductive assumptions here but this has to be actively probing channel balances in the same way that an attacker trying to undermine privacy would because the actual distribution of funds on each side of the channel is not publicly advertised in the routing graph or the gossip data like that is specifically left out because of the privacy implications of knowing exactly the allocation of channel balances and also because it would be very resource intensive to just gossip changes to that all around the lightning network e even like even if you didn't do it every payment just periodically that would be a massive increase in the amount of data so there is no way for the service to be gathering that data without actively probing and poking around the lightning network to figure out what those distributions are at times so Honestly, I really don't like this service. Um, I see why it exists. I think this is a net negative to the Lightning Network. And I think this is actually kind of proving a lot of my points in the article I wrote um, earlier this month in terms of liquidity allocation and incentives um, on the Lightning Network in the long term as they relate to privacy. Information about things like that is in and of itself valuable as demonstrated by the service that's literally charging to access this information to allocate your liquidity more efficiently. So like exactly the same types of incentives that I was talking about in that article in relation to big yield generating platforms like BlockFi and Ledin and so on as big players, I think will inevitably get into lightning routing in the long term, like they're starting to dip their toes into mining for predictable yield. Like it's happening before that's even happening, like the incentives to gather information and undermine you know, some degree of privacy on the Lightning Network because doing so is valuable information you can monetize. And this is seriously, like, this has to be thought about and dealt with in any way that it can be on a technological front because otherwise, this is just going to slowly erode all of the potential privacy gains that Lightning could provide just because 
there is a literal monetary incentive to erode it. And this is actually kind of happening a lot faster than I thought it would, given that a service like this exists now. So like this is a real long-term consideration with Lightning that you can't, like just shrugging it off and memeing on Twitter um, doesn't change the reality here. Like this is a serious issue that needs to be comprehensively thought about. Yep. That's where Lightning needs to, uh, you know, just continually step up and move those incentives in the right direction and uh, just get everything uh, kind of like in line with this uh, proper liquidity routing. I mean, because it just seems like it's all about like getting access to who needs liquidity and who doesn't and where is it and like how exactly do you uh, optimize for that without the surveillance side of it and... um, I just, yeah, we need to keep moving that forward however we can. Yep. Well, good for pointing people's eyes on it. Uh, Ellen Router Lookup need to uh, work out a technical way to solve that problem to where people aren't trying to uh, just look into everybody's nodes and try to build that surveillance net for to monetize, like, uh, like you're saying. That's the wrong direction. So... Janine, I think you have some pretty fucked updates. No. Yeah, in previous episodes, 200, 201, 202, 232, 254, and 274, I covered the U.S. government's case against Virgil Griffith, the former head of special projects at the Ethereum Foundation. He was arrested and charged in November 2019 with conspiring to help North Korea evade U.S. sanctions using Ethereum after he spoke at a blockchain conference there despite being denied permission by the State Department explicitly to go. Uh, The latest significant update, which was actually on August 13th, just before last episode, but was not enough time to notice and read through the entire thing, uh, the government filed their motions in limine uh, with the court. Um as a giant summary of the evidence they have against him that they plan to introduce. It's about 58 pages long, some of which we have already seen pieces of before in previous uh, filings, but I will highlight a few rather interesting parts. They seem to have uh, gained access to local files, emails, WhatsApp messages, and other social media or online messaging history for the period in question, and that's where a lot of this is coming from. So the first known instance of Virgil, according to this document, seeking to go on this chain North Korea extravaganza was in February 2018, where he proposed a plan to provide cryptocurrency services in the DPRK to a Singaporean contact known as Co-Conspirator 3 or CC3, who was scheduled to travel to the DPRK for a marathon. Griffith wrote in an electronic message, if you find someone in North Korea, we'd love to make a North or we'd love to make an Ethereum trip to DPRK and set up an Ethereum node. When CC3 questioned whether the plan would uh, made economic sense, Griffith responded, it does actually, it'll help them circumvent the current sanctions on them. CC3 agreed to assist. Um, the there's so there's other co-conspirators i think six in total um they're all identified by numbers one through six cc one through six it may be possible i think with limited even with the limited information here to figure out who they are um the government states toward the end of the document that each of the co-conspirators are presently unavailable because they are citizens of countries other than the united states and reside outside the united states Um, They do give some information like person is Singaporean, this person is British, blah, blah, blah. So uh, someone might be able to figure out who these people are. Um, But I have not done that yet. I may do that if it's interesting enough to me. But anyway, while I scroll. So uh, in April, this I think is still 2018, yeah. Griffith wrote that while he asked Ethereum management if we do we directly do this, he told that because of sanctions, only doing so through an intermediary is possible, and that as a U.S. citizen, he would be quote funneling things through Singapore slash China to avoid any problems with that. Uh, in August 2018, he wrote around asking for lawyers who specialized in sanctions related issues, and that he will quote try to. We'll try and set up a DPRK shell company. He also emailed two leaders of the Ethereum Foundation, not named, but um, might be easy to figure out who they are. One of them is a co-founder, 
of the Ethereum Foundation. They both encouraged him, or they both discouraged, sorry, discouraged him from proceeding with the project. So um, he clearly did not do that, but good to know that the foundation was both aware of it and they thought it was a bad idea. Uh, they should also maybe reconsider his uh, pushing with Saudi Arabia, but who knows. Um, Another quote, on April 17th, 2019, approximately one month after contacting the DPRK mission in Manhattan, Griffith received a visa to visit the DPRK, a copy of which he later posted to his Twitter account, subsequently admitted to law enforcement that he kept his visa separate from his passport in order to hide his travel to the DPRK from U.S. authorities. Now, this is one of kind of the hilarious parts of the A document, I think, because it's like, okay... So you go to the effort of, like, he also did not want them stamping his passport. They didn't do that. They, like, explicitly said they wouldn't stamp his passport. So he, like, went to the trouble of, like, keeping all evidence of his trip to the DPRK out of his passport. But then he posts a picture of the visa with his name to Twitter with a Twitter account under his real name. I mean, yeah. Einstein. Fail. <laughs> um, oh, and so, uh, yeah, we're getting to the interesting part. Let me scroll. So, uh, yeah, now to the deets that you've all been waiting for. What the hell did he say at the conference? Because we haven't actually gotten very much about that. We've gotten, like, a gist, not exact words. Well... Apparently, the government says that they will introduce various forms of contemporaneous evidence of what transpired at the conference. The government's evidence will include audio recordings from the conference, video clips of the conference, the defendant's remarks, notes written by Griffith and, uh, for his presentation, images of Griffith's writing on a whiteboard for the participants, and communications sent by Griffith to others during his time in the DPRK. So, like, yeah, imagine you go to a conference in North Korea, you'd think that it might be slightly easy to maybe not get all of that stuff taken by the US government eventually. But apparently, no, apparently this thing was recorded up the ass. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe not such a good thing. But um, yeah, later in the document, the government says that CC2, another co-conspirator, told Griffith to stress in his remarks that cryptocurrency and blockchain technologies could be used for money laundering and sanctions e evasion, since that was the basis for the attendees' interest in those technologies. <laughs> um, and the, the government also states at least some of this was recovered from a laptop that Griffith took with him to the DPRK. They don't give details of how they obtained the laptop, so not clear whether he took it to the U.S., or they, it was part of the stuff that they seized at any of his living places uh, in either the U.S. or Singapore. But uh, towards the end of the document, they state that the government's proof of these statements will come almost entirely from Griffith's digital devices and electronic accounts. Um, I would sure be interested to know the story of how they obtained all of this stuff, because it's quite substantial. Um, but yeah, so this, they, they include a transcript, uh, from the audio that they claim to have. And this is the beginning. This is literally like the first couple sentences of his talk. He says, hi everyone. My name is Virgil. I work for a group called the Ethereum foundation. We do a sort of next generation blockchain. I think the most valuable things we have to offer the DPRK are number one, we can give you. Uh, the blockchain gives you payments that the U.S. can't stop. And number two, we can give you contracts that don't go through the U.N. Pause for effect. <laughs> Peace palm. Hi, I'm from Ethereum. I'm here to help you terrorists. <laughs> you even hit, like, the perfect tone of voice, like some old school monotone video game recording. <laughs> Griffith also attempted to recruit other cryptocurrency professionals to travel to the DPRK in order to provide similar services to the DPRK within just one day of leaving the DPRK. Oh, but there's more. Shortly after leaving the DPRK on April 26, 2019, Griffith also wrote to his parents and sister, I think I'm going to be the connector in blockchain-mediated economic relations between DPRK and South Korea. Should be fun. Hopefully won't have much jail time for it. I'll try to be wealthy enough to pay my bail. 
End quote. Oh my god. Winning at wealth, losing at discretion. <laughs> this well, just keeps getting better. You know, when your first world superpower government tells you not to go talk to the tin pot dictator, I'm just saying, maybe consider the consequences of that if you ignore them and go talk to the tin pot dictator. Oh, but there's more. After the conference, FBI agents interviewed Griffith in person on May 22, 2019 and November 12, 2019. The FBI also interviewed Griffith over the phone on November 6, 2019. So yeah, this guy, um, yeah, let he talked to the FBI without a lawyer present on three occasions. Um, evidence of the defendant's post-conference conduct is also admissible pursuant to Rule 404B to prove, among other things, the defendant's motive, intent, preparation, plan, knowledge, and absence of mistake or accident. Griffith's actions during this period are particularly probative of Griffith's intent to violate sanctions, his knowledge that his actions would violate sanctions, and his plan and preparation to commit the charged crime in the face of that knowledge, because emphasis here Griffith pursued those actions even after the FBI expressly advised him that his conduct would likely violate the IEEPA, which is the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. The FBI provided Griffith this admonishment precisely because Griffith admitted to them that he was interested in returning to the DPRK and in facilitating cryptocurrency exchanges with the DPRK. Okay, so when the FBI agent is telling you that what you're doing may violate whatever the fuck sanctions he's just been telling you about for 15 minutes and what'll happen and which room in Guantanamo you'll get and all that shit, you should probably listen. On October 2nd, 2019, in a text exchange with family members, Griffith noted that he might be fired from Ethereum and stated that if he was, he might instead, quote, set up a money laundering company in North Korea. Oh my god. In conclusion, the government outlines various uh, bits of evidence that should be precluded or lines of argument that shouldn't be pursued at trial because it would waste, it would unnecessarily really waste time for example they anticipate that they're the defense is everybody else losing janine yeah would you say that again janine when we get you back the ethereum foundation came after her yeah looks like a little connection error Hopefully she'll be back shortly. This story just gets more and more crazy. This guy's like Mr. Magoo of the ETH Foundation. Hmm. Uh oh, SpaghettiOs. Don't get your passport stamped. Check. Hide your visa separately. Check. Don't post about your trip to a sanctioned country on North Korea. Sadly unchecked. Well, it's just, you know, Ethereum guys are not the smartest people. Unicorn couldn't save him this time. Mm. I think this is the longest she has gone AWOL ever due to connection errors. All right. Hey, I see you in the chat there, Vogue. Don't you dare call Oscorp fucking knockoff Gundam's gate. All right, so... I'm wondering if this might be a more permanent connection issue on her end and not just a quick glitch. Yeah, I think we got a message on Keybase to see. Ah, uh, she's not responding. Uh. Is this a fuck it, we'll do it live type situation? Uh, let's see. All right, so El Salvador, supposedly, next week. Beginning yeah. with the official Bitcoin currency? Yes. Yeah. So, oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay. Wind it back. Janine. Okay. What was the last thing you heard? Uh, FBI, maybe? That he was, uh, the FBI told him not to, uh, to work with the DPRK and he decided that he was going to might get fired from the Ethereum Foundation and do a money laundering operation. 
Yeah, so the the final bit is just that um, at the end of the document, obviously the type, the motion in Liny or Lim, Limini is uh, that the government outlines various uh, um, bits of evidence that should be precluded or lines of argument that shouldn't be pursued at trial because it would unnecessarily waste time. Um, for example, they expect that the defense will make the argument that because North Korea already had knowledge and or skills and or technology they could have done all of this stuff without his help and therefore him talking to them did not give them new tools or information and the government is basically saying that that line of argument is a waste of time to pursue because they say to convict griffith on the sole count of the indictment the government must prove only that the defendant willingly agreed with others to provide services to the dprk or DPRK persons without obtaining a license, or to evade and avoid sanctions against North Korea with respect to the provision of such services, or to attempt to do so. The government need not prove that Griffith's services were in fact helpful to the government of the DPRK, or even any individual attending the conference, so long as Griffith agreed with others and intended to provide a service to evade or avoid sanctions. The conspiracy need not, be, need not have succeeded in providing the DPRK with a service, let alone one that was demonstrably helpful to the DPRK. Well, it sounds like it was a lot of fight to try and help them for just to really just try and a fight to get arrested as hard as, hard as you could. I don't know. It just, it seemed like uh, they kept telling him like this, but he knew that this was definitely breaking the law, but I guess he believed in Ethereum and crypto so much that it was just going to win the day, which, you know, I see you, uh, Sh Shino, talking sometimes on Twitter where people just have this belief that like, oh, well, because Bitcoin, like, you know, things will win. And it's like, if you go against the forces that be that, you know, you're under their control. I mean, like, uh, this is what happens is where this whole... Bitcoin play is like an underhanded move to try and get, you know, <laughs> get the government under control. It's not like you're just supposed to recklessly go after it. And I, I, I just think this is a little reckless where he did what he did. But, you know, people are going to take their move. There, There's also a part about um, so like while he was between interviews with the FBI, he decided that he should maybe get rid of his U.S. citizenship or at least get a second passport. And the government brings that up to make the argument that, you know, he had already gone and broken the law by traveling to DPRK without permission and this conspiracy that they allege. Um, it doesn't work to try to get out from under that by retroactively getting rid of your U.S. citizenship. It doesn't work that way. He could have avoided this entire situation by doing that first <laughs> before he went, uh, and that would have solved the whole problem. But no, he did it the other way around, all in the wrong order. <sighs> Mr. Magoo. Well, yep. He's in the. <laughs> it's, it's never really like so definitive, but this is pretty definitive. Well, we ready for the next one? Yeah. So, how's things going with the El Salvador legal tender moves? We are eight days from the law going into effect, and. They are apparently in the middle of rolling out 200 um, Bitcoin ATMs all across the country, as well as um, setting up 50 financial branches, which effectively are, if you've ever seen the little bank tellers um, in a grocery store, they're just a little booth set up like that, um, to have available and ready to go when the law comes into effect. Um, so obviously everybody has heard my thoughts on the overall situation a million times over. I'm just going to skip past that today. Uh, but in terms of this deployment, I'm kind of my, – my big concern here is how many competent people are there 
that are going to be manning these different branches for exchange points here or dealing with issues that people have with these ATMs and really what is their degree of competence in terms of Bitcoin? Like what is, like what kind of issues are, are they going to run into operating these things? Like I'm assuming um, that these ATMs are going to support Lightning. So the liquidity dynamics of a channel, what happens if a channel is too imbalanced one way for somebody to zap off a lightning payment to sell something like that could be a potential issue there, you know, and it's really, I think like the most important part of this really in the, the short term after everything goes live is going to be seeing like what types of issues like that pop up like how are they dealt with are are the you know is this whole project manned and staffed by people competent enough to to deal with all the issues that pop up and kind of see like how that plays out because that will be a massive learning experience for any entity in future whether it's a private entity in another country like this that tries to do such a massive you know rollout of exchange infrastructure it'll be interesting to see like you're saying i mean uh it's scheduled to roll out in eight days i'm sure there's going to be hiccups and some technical difficulties along the way and we'll see how quickly they get ironed out but i do know like yeah there's there's good people in the country moving throughout, like traveling. Like, I mean, you know, of course there was scammers as well. And, uh, you know, we'll see how it goes. What is next? Well, it looks like Nigeria is going full crazy here. Yeah, there was a short video shared a lot on Twitter um, of someone representing the Nigerian government saying that because of a third wave of COVID infections being on the rise, you will, quote, not be allowed to access banking services from the middle of September if you have not been vaccinated. And then they said something about you will still be able to do so remotely from your homes. Um, so it's not completely cutting people off, but obviously if you if you're a person in Nigeria who doesn't have good home internet or you're cash based or whatever, then uh, then it's a problem for you. Um, so given that I I do not and you should not just trust random clips you find on Twitter, I went looking for the original source video and the clip was taken from an English language television and radio channel focused on Nigeria. Um, it said it was an independent radio station. I'm not familiar with it though, so I don't know if it actually is, but it was posted on August 23rd. Links in the description um, and the text around the video said, the governor of Edo State, Mr. Goodwin Obaseki, says beginning from the second week of September, large gatherings in public spaces would only be accessed by persons who have vaccination proof um, after receiving at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Governor Obaseki disclosed this during the launching of the second phase of COVID-19 vaccination in Benin City. Um, so yeah, the clip seems legit. They had a longer portion of it and the restrictions also among large gatherings, they included church attendance and receptions and things like that. Well, that sounds pretty bad. But yeah, I mean, this is an instance of like you're getting cut off from the mind system if in I mean a lot of people might be getting cut off if they don't get the vaccine so that's like a demonstrable effect on people's lives I mean obviously if you have banking remotely then it won't affect you but I don't know what percentage of Nigeria is still uh, unbanked and or and or mostly relies on cash it puts the chip inside its skin or else it gets the hose again. Well, I'm looking at what at, at I hate 1999 is a Bitcoin core contributor who is in Nigeria. And I'm just like, uh, I don't know. I've seen a lot on Bitcoin Twitter about Nigeria where like Ray Yusuf um, from Pax Fools over there and 
they talk about Nigeria as being like kind of ahead of the game when it comes to their younger population working with Bitcoin. I hope that they, uh, you know, get to move in to where, you know, the average normies in Nigeria can use it as well. So um, they don't feel like they have to get quote unquote vaccinated. All right. You want to move into a favorite punching bag? Conbase? Oh, this, this is fun. All right. So USDC is back in the news, and it might all just be fluff to make them sound better than USDT, but let's hash through it anyway. So Coinbase stated on their website since the release of USDC that every USDC was fully, quote, backed by dollars in a bank account, close quote. Now, this past July, Grant Thornton of Centre, the consortium put together by Circle and Coinbase to keep USDC accountable, released a blog post showing the reserve assets for all the USDC in circulation. And contrary to Coinbase's website, the attestation of assets shows only 61% of USDC was backed by dollars in a bank account. The remaining assets to back USDC aren't considered liquid enough to be quickly and efficiently redeemed back into dollars. And that's uh, the other percentages. That's 13% that they have in Yankee CD, CDs or Certificate of Deposits with Foreign Banks. Then 12% were in U.S. Treasuries, 9% in Commercial Paper, 5% in Corporate Bonds, and 0.2% in U.S. Agencies and Municipal Bonds. Now, Emily Choi, sorry if I show you that, COO of Coinbase, took to the Twitter airwaves to calm regulators and investors' sentiments about the attestation of assets released by Grant. She said in a thread, quote, Starting September 2021, USDC reserves will be held in cash and short-duration U.S. government treasuries. This is the approach we want for USDC reserves. USDC has always been fully backed by reserves equal to or greater than the USDC in circulation, giving users the ability to always redeem one USD coin for one US dollar. We know that a lot of customers get USDC on Coinbase, and we previously said that every USDC is backed by a dollar in a bank account. Our language could have been clearer here. When Circle shared their May report about USDC reserves in late July, which included a more diversified pool of investments for the first time, we should have moved faster to update statements like that on our website. That was a mistake, and Coinbase takes ownership for that. In any case, the changes in the investment portfolio for USDC reserves began, began in May 2021 and will not extend past September. Centre, along side circle will ensure that the USDC investments revert back to a more conservative investment profile by the end of September. So to be clear, the next two attestation reports, June and July, for USDC reserves will show a diversified investment portfolio. This will, res this will res reverse beginning with the month of August. We're excited about the continued growth and adoption of USDC, which will become the largest regulated stablecoin in the world with a market cap of nearly $28 billion, close quote. And there you have it. Through a blog post attestation from Circle and Coinbase's consortium Centre, with a correction from Coinbase's COO and some changes to Circle's policy for reserve assets, presto! It looks like a Decentraland project with some accountability. It should be noted that USDC is the world's second largest stablecoin. The world's largest stablecoin, Tether, is currently under scrutiny by Washington for its claim that each token is backed by US, one US dollar, either through cash or assets like bonds. Regulators continue to seek to examine if a run on stablecoins could cause a sell-off in the underlying assets backstopping them. So this all sounds like USDC playing pretty for the market and regulators to compete with Tether, but it also feels like a corresponding attack on Bitcoin. While they are playing the pretty stablecoin narrative, this asset now has over $27 billion in investors, while what's backing it is centralized all the way down to the protocols. USDC is run on Ethereum ERC-20 tokens, Tron TRC-20 tokens, and the network Solana and Algro Algroland. 
<clears throat> this all looks and sounds like decentralized theater to convince everyone to operate on their stablecoin, not backed by anything decentralized, any real hard assets. I don't know where this goes, but it sounds like it's going to hurt a lot of investors or users of this platform. What do you guys think? So, FUD, I think somebody forgot to wait until the law passed and the Treasury decided what their arbitrary rules to fuck Tether were before making their own Treasury reflect those rules. <laughs> well, Ginsler was out there talking about it. And what's interesting to me is even if these changes started happening a while ago, they happen to be very much in line with the criticisms that uh, Tether received from people like Ginsler as far as not being only in very high quality government USD assets. Uh, so that's that, that's fun. It seems like they are trying to position for that stamp of approval in the future. So definitely interesting there. Yeah. Emily, Emily Choi was the same person, if I recall correctly, that when Coin, after Coinbase kind of got rid of the hacking team people they hired i think at consensus she said something like oh it was an oversight it was an oopsie we didn't mean it we didn't know and it's like obviously they did we all know that because there was no way you couldn't know unless you were a complete idiot um so yeah that interesting i think it's also interesting that when uh a stablecoin as large as USDC makes changes like this, they kind of constrain the practical limits of what somebody like Facebook's DM can do around money because uh, they're out there, they're accepted, they're you know prominent in the community. And the way Congress kind of shut down Facebook on the DM thing just with sentiment the first time around, just this project changing and existing could cut down on the paths that something like DM could take. Because this is basically what they were talking about doing for some part of their assets, like their, the USD part. But they were also talking about doing euros and other currencies and this and that and the next thing. And when the government can point to this thing that's regulated, that wants to be a bank, et cetera, and say, hey, this is as good as PayPal, perhaps, in our eyes, as a US dollar exchange mechanism, it makes it much harder for somebody like Diem to be like, look, we want to incorporate everybody, we want to own this world market and whatnot. And the regulators can just be like, look, we want it in US dollars. It's that simple. And look at what everybody else is doing. Uh huh. It definitely looks like, you know, USDC is working in tandem with US regulators to you know, pull out the stops that they want. And that's what it looks like. It looks like they want everything 100% backed in dollars. So it does look like, uh, I mean, it's definitely something that I'm sure Tether's probably talking about. <laughs> this is how you try to prop the dollar up while Bitcoin eats everything. You digitize it, you remove the friction so that as Bitcoin grows, so does the dollar that it trades in. Like... The reality is behind the, the scenes under all the goofy clowns we see on TV, there are a lot of people in these institutions that fully understand that dynamic. Yep. And you talk when you're talking in regulator tone of voice about U.S. citizens and making sure they're safe with dollars and and making sure, you know, it's not systemically important or undermining the U.S. financial system and out of one side of your mouth. And you completely ignore that this vector allows dollarization of the world over the Internet. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this it's, it's evolving. It's, yeah, it is probably why the ECB is talking about making their own CBDC, is the U.S. is already very strong at this. The, the private sector is providing dollars as need be, and evidently the private sector is not that interested in euro dollars and or the public isn't. So, huh, scratch your chin, get a little central bank involvement, maybe we can make it go big. Yeah. All right. Next up, in terms of payments, 
One of the largest payments that uh, most people have on a monthly basis is for housing. Um, there's some news up here that uh, United Mortgage, sorry, United Wholesale Mortgage is going to start accepting Bitcoin payments. You know, I'm not usually a big fanboy of people necessarily or of companies necessarily announcing um, that they accept Bitcoin payments. Um, this one maybe is worth announcing simply because, again, the largest payment that people typically have is a home mortgage. And, you know, the longest run asset that a lot of people hold these days is Bitcoin. Uh, so just seeing a company, and I believe they are number two, they're the second largest mortgage lender in the United States, uh, start to accept Bitcoin for mortgage payments. That's just a great loop close to see. Get your Bitcoin mortgages or pay your mortgage with Bitcoin rather. Yeah, mom, is, is Bitcoin valid money yet if I can pay my mortgage with it? I think she'd still say no. She wants to hold it in her hand. I'll hold it and she can hold the house. It'll be good. Yeah. All right. Next up, uh, FATF fun. Oh, great. Yeah. So one of the um, protocol implementers um, for FATF travel rule compliance is this idiotic company called Shift. Um, that is pretty much building things out on a fork of Ethereum with smart contracts. And apparently, um, yeah, BitMEX and uh, Deribit have just jumped on board. Um, is in addition to Binance, Bitfinex, Tether, Hoibe, and um, a lot of other companies. So, um, yeah, uh, this is gearing up at least specifically with anything interacting um, with Ethereum is going to be probably dominant, at least with Ethereum based shit, um, but is in general going to be one of the big competitors now for implementing this. And it's it's kind of fucking sick uh, how many people are jumping in to compete with uh, complying with all this crap. Yeah, I caught somebody's tweet a little bit ago. I wish I had it right in front of me. It was something like, Ethereum is a CBDC in disguise. Yeah. <sighs> it's just upsetting to see, like, these, yeah, these exchanges who for a long time, you know, I mean, like, uh, geez, uh, Bitfinex? No, okay. Yeah, others, like, working to just try and implement this, um, this compliance where it's like breaking it's trying to break bitcoin like uh it's crazy like good god yeah as long as you can sell it somebody's gonna try to build it we've seen that all over the place here i wonder if some of them are just saying they're building it to try and work with say that they're pretend like they're working with them but i mean like that's giving them a little too much rope <laughs> you know yeah, stay busy, dev companies. I hope you're not burning your own dollars. All right. Well, I guess that covers the desk. What's going on for final thoughts? My final thought is that if anyone didn't see it, uh, Jack Dorsey made a tweet about how he wanted to build an open platform for a decentralized Bitcoin exchange. And BISC our favorite actual decentralized exchange responded to say, you know, they've spent five years building that out. Working on V2, let's talk, our heads together could result in something better than any of us could imagine. Jack responded with definitely, and then he tagged, I think, Brock M, the person who was in the original tweet from him, and uh, there was also a tweet, I can't remember from who, but someone in the Ethereum space who made this comment about how, oh, the reason Jack isn't talk about isn't talking about ether cool Ethereum stuff is because he muted the word Ethereum on Twitter many years ago and he hasn't been keeping up with all the innovation. And then Jack actually responded to that and he was like, nah. Good deal. Burn.
which uh, you know makes sense to say when uh, Ethereum is uh, dealing with chain split chaos. And uh, a few days ago, I actually was a bit interested to see like, oh, so what's the what's the proof of stake thing doing? Is it here yet? I honestly have no clue. I was looking and looking and looking. Finally found some video of Vitalik talking to someone from Pussy Riot. And he said that the Ethereum should transition to proof of stake in six months. So like January, February, 2022. So we got a new deadline, guys. 2022, January, oh. be there. Okay. It's happening. Jeff, maybe not. Who knows? Could take forever. Another two weeks to two years to two decades. Well, what other thoughts? Uh, now would be a good time for everybody to inspect their seatbelts. Make sure they're in one piece. There's not a lot of fraying going on, you know patch up anything that looks like an issue you know practice you know routine uh safety drills exit procedures stuff like that because uh it's about to get exciting around here boys and girls i just i got this feeling i can yeah. feel it coming in the air tonight yeah I guess I'll say my final thought is, I guess, like, the last U.S. troops are leaving Afghanistan, supposedly, today. That, that's, I don't know. Like, uh, for sure, the whole administration of this presidency is falling apart to where it just looks like a shadow of a person. And, yeah, I don't know the throwing, you know, gasp of that administration, what they're going to do. But for sure, it does seem like they want to talk about vaccine mandates and you know mass mandates again which like if you got your ears and your eyes on you you should know that means it's time to stand up to this shit and just say no and that that's a bunch of horse shit and it's time to just yeah i don't know ride this thing out well i still cannot believe that idiots out there are listening to a Wookiee tell them that a seven mnemonic seed multi-sig is the most secure way to store your money. Most people are lucky if they have a single secondary location where they can safely store a seed phrase away from other ones. You're lucky if you're in that situation. Seven fucking seed phrases that are all going to mostly be in one place, thereby negating any of the benefits of fucking multi-sig whatsoever. Have fucking fun losing your coins, Voldemort. I wish you well. Adios, punks. Later, everyone. Bye. Oh,